also we acknowledge the also the light keepers, the the, the medicine holders, the people who have been keeping these medicines in the, their traditions throughout human civilization, allowing us to expand our consciousness and to use these medicines for healing, particularly in many indigenous cultures. So we acknowledge all of those. And now we're just gonna show you a very short video about Mind Medicine Australia before we continue with a short introductory slides and then introduce Dr. Kotler and, and Professor Fuston. Thank you so much, everyone watching the video now. Did you know that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime? That's nearly half of us. Everything feels flat in my heart, sleep, I don't I like us. I feel ashamed. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder, with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry, and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again, with proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. We will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. Excellent. So we'd love you to share that video and um, spread the word about Mind Medicine Australia's work and we'll talk just very briefly now with a couple of uh, introductory slides. So Scarlett or Ilan, if you could put the slides on, please. Uh, yes, I'll be sharing the slides. Hold on. Here we are. Thank you, and I'll just um, I'll just call for next slide for the time being, Scarlett. When I need the next slide, thank you. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. So, just a reminder that we are recording this session, and we do publish these webinars on our social media platform, and and encourage you to share them. And there's many people who've registered for this event, well over 300, um, who some of whom can't join us now, but will watch the recording. Next slide, thank you. Next slide. So in Australia, we have an accelerating mental health crisis. Pre-COVID, one in five Australian adults with a chronic mental illness, one in eight on antidepressants, including one in four older adults, and one in 30 children on antidepressants as young as four years of age. These numbers have been significantly exacerbated by the COVID pandemic and the bushfire crisis that preceded that as well. An estimate of one in two of us will experience a mental illness in our lifetime. No, sorry. Um, 
Ilan or Scarlett, you are going to have to really make sure that we we mute everyone. Scarlett, would you be able to? Yeah, I'll just stop sharing for one second, Tanya, um, to make sure that um, Ilan is a co-host. Um, and yeah, if everyone could please um, be muted while we go through the presentation, that would be wonderful and helpful. Oh, and, and throughout the whole session, please. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, but there should be an automated setting for that, Scarlett. There always has been in every other way. Uh, yes, normally it's set up that way. So as in in the um, in the setup before we start, uh, I can't do it while I share the screen at the same time. So I've made Diego a co-host as well, and Ilan is a co-host. So if you can please look after the muting, and I'll share the screen now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so this is something that, that is personal for every one of us, because if it's not me, it's you. And this is our loved ones, our brothers, our sisters, our mums, our dads, our children, our cousins, our work colleagues. Next slide, thank you. So the elephant in the room, as we call it, is the lack of innovation and treatments for mental illness. So our government talks a lot about new access pathways. It talks a lot about training more psychiatrists and more psychologists to treat people with mental illness. It talks about creating more mental health plans that are funded by the government. But the fact of the matter is, is if we can't get to the root cause of a person's mental illness, they're not going to get better. And that's why the crisis is getting worse. And that elephant's got a very good point, I think. Next slide. So there's been no improvement in treatment outcomes over the past 50 years. In the case of depression, only 30 to 35% of sufferers experience remission from current treatments, primarily antidepressants or other psychiatric medications plus, pharma, plus psychotherapy. And of course, the side effects are, are significant. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, remission rates are as low as 5% from existing treatments. Next slide, thank you. So my husband, Peter Hunt, and I set up Mind Medicine Australia two and a half years ago to expand the treatment options available to medical practitioners and their patients. Our goal is to establish safe, effective psychedelic assisted treatments to cure a range of mental illnesses. At the moment, we're primarily uh, focused on medicinal psilocybin for depression and medicinal MDMA for PTSD and also potentially addiction. However, we are interested in other psychedelic medicines that are also being trialled around the world, including ketamine, ibogaine, DMT, and so on. And also LSD is also being uh, trialled in, in various places as well. For us, success means that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system. That means that they become a first-line treatment along with current existing psychiatric medicine, psychotherapy, and other medications with full disclosure on the risks and benefits of each by the medical practitioner in consultation with the patient. So the patient and the doctor make their minds up about what they think is the most suitable treatment for that patient. That the medicines will continue to achieve high remission rates. And at the moment we're seeing remission rates of 60 to 80% across 160 current and recent trials, which is significant and obviously a lot higher than the 5% or the 30 to 35% I just mentioned. And that these treatments are accessible and affordable to all Australians in need, no matter where they're based or their financial circumstances. Next slide. So the remarkable thing about these treatments, as, as many of you will know, is that they only require two to three dose sessions with a short course of psychotherapy in contrast to for what many people is a, is a life sentence of a mental illness and a lifetime use of psychiatric medicines or psychotherapy or, or both. This is the chance for people to actually get well, to be cured, which is why the medicines are considered curative, not palliative. It's not just about managing a condition or numbing it out. It's actually about getting to the cause and getting people well and out of the system. The medicines are considered very safe in medically controlled environments and are non-addictive. Both have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the US. And that therapy designation is very rarely granted. It is only 
granted to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track the approval process. Next slide, thank you. So, oh, where's my um, Silas Ivan slide gone? Oh. Okay. The one with the neural networks. Are you using that one, Ali? No? Hmm? Okay. Uh, this is um, from the one Ilan sent through. I'm not sure. sure. Okay. Next slide. Thank you. So um, I was going to show you a wonderful slide, and we'll we'll put it on the screen in a moment. Um, Scarlett, I'll ask you to source that mm -hmm. and put it on the slide in a moment. If you could grab it for me, I'll I'll just show it just before Ellie and sure. um, you know the one I mean. Yeah, with the the neural networks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, just a note too on MDMA. MDMA is not ecstasy. Very important to say. So unfortunately, MDMA has been given a bad name because it's often adulterated with other substances sold to young people at dance parties and raves and taken in combination with alcohol and other substances, dehydration leading to bad effects. Quite often the capsules don't have MDMA in them at all. But MDMA does have the effect of decreasing fear and defensiveness, increases empathy, trust and safety, and decreases the activity of the amygdala and the fight and flight response that often re-triggers or re-traumatizes. Could we go back, please, Sorry. Carla? Often re-triggers or traumatizes a patient when they are asked to recollect or recount their trauma. In the recent MAPS phase two trials, 105 patients, all with treatment resistant PTSD for an average of 18 years, 52% went into remission immediately and 68% of the 12 month follow up. In the current phase three trials uh, that have just been announced, the part one of those are showing at least a 67% remission rate already for the patients and it's expected that they will be much higher emission rates as the patients integrate. Because as many of you will understand, the integration process for these medicines is critical to their success. It's not just the medicine, it is the actual psychotherapy, which is why these treatments are called psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. It is the medicine plus the therapy that leads to the outstanding outcomes that we're seeing. Uh, I'll just go through briefly our strategy now, and then I'm going to ask Scarlett to show us just the one other very wonderful slide, because I think it ties in very nicely into the talk we're about to, to um, do. So sure. we'll do that now, Scarlett. Yes. So Mind Medicine Australia was set up really to build the ecosystem for these medicines and treatments to be available in Australia. And we do that through a range of different strategies, awareness and knowledge building, so education events, free webinar series like this one, a major international medical summit in November, with some of the leading speakers, scientists, researchers from around the world. We might even be able to persuade Carl to, to join us for that. We also have started chapters all around Australia and New Zealand to further build awareness and educate local communities and run events. And we're interested in promoting and funding relevant research. We have commenced the first ever certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies in the Southern Hemisphere. And Dr. Kotler is one of the first graduates of that first cohort. And he might be able to share a bit of that with us later on. And our second intake commences in a few weeks and is nearly full. I think there's about five places remaining. So if you are a therapist on this call and want to sign up for that, hurry up. <laughs> We'd love to welcome you. We are also looking at setting up an Asia Pacific Centre for Emerging Mental Health Therapies in partnership with some universities in Australia for advanced research development, supply chains, agribusiness, medicine manufacturing and economic analysis. We're also looking at the preferred legal and ethical frameworks for the medicines. We've done that through rescheduling applications and as many of you will know, the TGA have announced recently an independent review of our rescheduling applications, which is a positive sign. And we also are finding a number of psychiatrists and some GPs gaining special access scheme approvals to treat patients on a case-by-case -case basis who are treatment resistant, uh, 
with either psilocybin or MDMA, depending on what condition they're suffering from. So we've had more than, I think, nearly about 40 of those approvals come through so far. And we're wrestling with um, federal and state legislations, which unfortunately uh, conflict, meaning that we're getting federal approvals, but some of the states uh, don't recognize the medicines as medicines, which um, is a problem. So we need to work with them so that they create medical exemptions. Um, Scarlett, if we could put that other slide on now, please, that'd be wonderful. And then I'll introduce um, Ellie and Carl. Sure, just give me one moment, Tanya. Yeah. I'll be with you in a moment. Okay. And I hope that we are on the same page and that this is the slide you need. I'm just sharing now. Yes, that's the one. Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you. My favorite slide in the whole Mine too. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> so um this, um, this is a really interesting representation of um, fMRI scans of, of a patient with, um, with and without psilocybin. So on the one on the right, Ellie, you might also want to comment on this one. I love the way you describe this one. So um, if there's anything I missed, please jump in. But um, the interesting thing about these two circles is firstly, the same amount of lines in both circles. But you can see with the, the one on the right that there's fairly limited neural connectivity. So the different hemispheres of the brain are not really talking that much. And the one on the left, you see this massive neurogenesis that's being created by the ingestion of the psilocybin, leading to new neural connect, uh, networks being created, increased neural plasticity, which leads to that incredible sense of oneness and connection that patients feel on psilocybin, which is the doorway or the window into therapeutic success and which this connection allows um, the patient to feel a sense of ongoing connection if they have the right therapy and the right integration process. And Ellie, did you want to um, add anything else to that at the moment? Uh, just that for people to notice at the moment, the number of new connections, because that will be very relevant for the talk. Yes. So that there are Lots of new connections made. Absolutely. And, you know, for many um, people describing what mental illness and certainly depression is today, a number of people actually say it's not necessarily a brain chemistry imbalance. It's actually a sense of disconnection. And if we can increase connection for people with themselves, with others, with the planet, then there's a real chance for, for them to actually become empowered for their own healing. And to enable them to break out of those repetitive, rigid, stuck thoughts that we showed in, in the video at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Anyway, with that, I think, uh, are we up to the introduction to um, Professor Friston Scarlett? I believe so. Excellent. Over to you, Carl. Well, I'll, I'll let Ali, Ali, would you like to introduce the, the professor? That'd be mm -hmm. good. Oh, we've just got you on mute there. Um, I mean, to, to introduce uh, Professor Carl Friston properly would take about an hour. <laughs> uh, I won't do that, but it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that um, Professor Friston is one of the foremost neuroscientists in the world today. He first became very influential actually through work in um, brain scans. Um, and he's revolutionized our understanding and ability to scan people's brains. Um, and he's won numerous, numerous, numerous awards. Um, but more recently, he's become very influential because of his free energy uh, theory as applied to, uh, it's, it's, um, it's mathematically modeling how the brain works and it's been able to be mapped onto the neural architecture and it's revolutionized our understanding of the brain. I've seen him compared to Charles Darwin in the impact of his theories. I don't know how he would feel about that. He also has to be a very modest person, I think, so he probably wouldn't like that. Um, but I, think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. But um, yeah, just to, just to impress that um, he knows what he's talking about. 
<laughs> well, welcome, Carl. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. No, I, I do like being compared with Charles Darwin, but I wouldn't say so out loud. So, <laughs> thank you for that love, lovely introduction. Let me just um, organise myself and share my screen and then... Good. Well, it's a great pleasure and honour uh, to be asked to talk to you. Um, I think what you're doing um, in Australia is, is, is um, amazing and I hope will set the, be a poster child uh, where other uh, countries and nations can follow suit. Um, my contribution to this discussion is, as Ellie was intimating, from the perspective of a neuroscientist and in particular um, theoretical neuroscience. So what I hope to do is just basically lay the groundwork for a relatively simple but informed framework in which we can understand why things like psilocybin and uh, in general um, neuromodulators and particularly those that act upon the serotonergic receptors may be so important and so powerful in the way that we make sense of the world. And in particular, um, what can go wrong if we have um, aberrant function of these neurotransmitter systems. Um, so my talk is going to be using psychosis and schizophrenia as a very extreme example of what can go wrong when making sense of the world um, that, can, um, that rests upon an understanding of the message passing and the connectivity that we've just been talking about that is exquisitely sensitive to the action of um, these um, potentially uh, therapeutic drugs. Um, so the basic idea, so I'm going to stand back and just think, well, well how can we understand psychopathology in general and in specifically um, as an extreme example, psychosis? Um, standing back and asking what is the fundamental problem that we're dealing with here? And I'm going to um, tell a story that rests upon something called synaptopathy or a synaptic disconnection, a disconnection of the, uh, the microscopic connections between um, neurons and how that can lead to psychopathology. Um, I'm then going to talk about um, simulations and theoretical formulations of active inference, the way that we interrogate and relate and make sense of the world, and in particular using a theoretical framework called predictive coding. And within that framework, highlight the central role and notion of something called precision. Um, and then I'm going to conclude with some brief simulations of false inference, um, showing you how one can simulate in silico uh, certain cardinal aspects of uh, psychosis or uh, abnormal perception and sense making of the world. So um, this is the basic idea. Now, in my world, psychology, by which I basically mean everything that underwrites action and perception, can be reduced to inference. And by inference, I just mean um, inferring the causes of our sensations, inferring the consequences of our actions. And if that's right, then it means that abnormal psychology or psychopathology must in some sense correspond to false inference. And by false inference, I mean exactly the kind of incorrect inferences that you would make if you were a statistician. So for example, inferring something was not there when it was. And that would be, if you like, um, a description of uh, an illusion or a hallucination. Or you can make the other kind of error, inferring something is there when it isn't. Sorry, that would be an hallucination. Conversely, inferring something is not there when it is, that would correspond to, for example, in neurology, uh, an, an agnosia, um, uh, an ability to, say, um, recognise uh, the fact that a particular person was, uh, was in front of you when seeing their face. So that's the idea. Specifically, false inference of this sort, uh, I'm going to suggest, reflects a failure to encode not the content of our beliefs, but the attention paid to various sources of evidence. And that attention is going to be underwritten by the notion of precision. So precision just means 
um, the predictability or the confidence that you afford to a particular belief or a particular source of information. Technically, it's the inverse variance of a probability distribution. So I'm going to talk about Bayesian beliefs, which may or may not be personal. Um, and when I talk about the precision of a belief, uh, if it's very precise, it's a very tight, confident belief, uh, because I believe that um, this is a very precise explanation for or summary of, um, of some state of affairs. So in functional terms, what this basic hypothesis says is that aberrant precision um, can be a computational explanation for the kinds of computational failures you might see in psychopathology. From the point of view of physiology and pharmacology, what this um, the story means is that what we would expect to see in psychopathology is an abnormal neuromodulation, an abnormal sensitization of certain neural populations or neurons to their inputs. And we're going to see that there's a close connection between the functional precision of a belief and uh, the uh, action of neuromodulators. So let me just motivate that from the point of view of, say, schizophrenia or the symptoms and signs of psychosis generally. And what I've done here on this side, I've just listed some of the positive system, uh, um, symptoms um, of schizophrenia, for example, delusions, hallucinations, and thought disorder, and then some of the negative uh, symptoms, psychometric poverty and soft neurological signs. But I just want to focus on the productive, positive um, symptoms and signs of psychosis and note that they can all be cast as false inference. So delusions are false beliefs about um, states of affairs, uh, intentions, the presence of things out there that are just not there that can be elaborated in terms of delusional systems. Hallucinations are just perceptual false inference, seeing something when it is not there, inferring it's out there when it's not. Um, and more subtle forms of thought disorder, loosening of associations and a Bloilerian disintegration of the psyche. And in short, what we have is abnormal beliefs that characterize the symptoms and signs of psychosis basically can be written or read as false inference. And indeed, if you think about all kinds of psychopathology, ranging from uh, the dysmorphophobia um, of anorexia nervosa right through to anxiety, in a sense, all of them can be understood from the point of view of both a psychiatrist and a patient uh, or a sufferer um, as some abnormal belief formation, some abnormal uh, belief updating um, leading to the this um, uh, leading to a psychopathology from the physiological point of view schizophrenia is usually explained in terms of a pathology of synaptic connections and in particular most mechanistic or etiological theories focus on one or more a particular neurotransmitter system. So we, um, in my world, everybody um, knows about the dopamine hypothesis uh, leading to explanations in terms of abnormal plasticity and aberrant salience. Um, recently, or not so, so recently, but certainly um, over the past few decades, a lot of attention being played uh, to the role of uh, glutamate. And in particular, the this is um, uh, the kind of um, receptor or drug that acts, sorry, neurotransmitter that acts on receptors that control um, fast inhibitory interneurons that set the gain and the sensitivity, this sort of um, neuromodulatory control of the excitability or the, the receptiveness of neural populations in these neural networks. Uh, a lot of interest recently in um, uh, the role of interaction between an MDA receptor function and um, inhibitory interneurons, GABAergic um, explanations for schizophrenia uh, in terms of aberrant gain control, abnormal excitation, inhibition, balance. So the you know the emerging story, the sort of the coarse grain picture here, is that all of these explanations at some level implicate an aberrant neuromodulation or a failure of synaptic gain control. So the idea now is to try and put these two things together and think about the kind of disconnection that might be a good explanation for this disintegration of the psyche. So I use this, uh, this phrase, disintegration of the psyche, because it speaks very nicely to putting things back together or disconnecting them um, with reference to those uh, functional connectivity 
um, um, co um, connectograms that we, uh, we saw in the introduction. So, uh, a phrase that comes from Bloiler, um, so implying this disintegration of conscious processing. Um, and his kind of functional disconnection was really focusing much more on the synaptic level um, or if it was rewritten nowadays, um, as opposed to other ideas about the, um, the causes of psychosis um, summarized here by Wernicke's junction hypothesis. So this was a, a, a similar idea, but mechanistically framed at the level of actually cutting white matter or connections between neurons. So I've tried to just illustrate the difference between the two mechanistic uh, understandings of this kind of synaptic disconnection in terms of cutting wires on a circuit board as opposed to breaking transistors. And currently, um, most people, I think, would subscribe to this metaphor that somehow the failures of game control, the neuro failure, aberrant neuromodulation is likened to a failure of a transistor or, um, on a circuit or a failure of a gate in a silicon chip nowadays. Um, I'll just briefly show this slide and then pass over it. The, 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 the idea behind showing this slide is to say that there's lots and lots of convergent evidence that the abnormalities of neuronal communication and message passing, certainly in psychosis and schizophrenia specifically, are likely to lie at the level of this um, synaptic uh, pathology. Because if you look at all the genes that contribute to the risk for schizophrenia, they almost invariably um, target or are involved in the sensitivity of neuronal receptors to their, to their inputs. And I'm uh, just showing the various paths that converge on this common um, etiology, which again is this, uh, if you like, um, synaptic pathology that, in, um, that causes an abnormal gain or sensitivity. So why is that important? Well, so now what we're going to do, we're going to move gears and um, just think about what the brain is doing and how important that sort of abnormality of gain control or sensitivity might be. And I'm going to do that through the lens of predictive coding precision. So this is now me talking as a theoretical neuroscientist, trying to understand functional architectures in the brain and how the brain works and what it is doing. And the story I'm going to um, tell here is a story that's gained incredible traction over the past um, uh, 10 or 20 years. And that's the notion of the brain as a constructive organ, um, an organ that constructs explanations, hypotheses, fantasies that best explain its sensory impressions, the sensory input on the sensory epithelia. So literally, the brain is a fantastic organ in the sense that it's generating these fantasies and then checking the goodness of those fantasies against the sensory evidence. So this is very much a sort of inside out perspective on sense making and perception, as opposed to 20th century views where sensations impress themselves on the brain and somehow information was extracted and outside in. But we're gonna to commit to an inside out uh, approach, beautifully illustrated by uh, the 16th century oil painter famed for doing still lives that when viewed from a different perspective, create a very different explanation um, for this particular pattern of sensory information. So if previously you saw a bowl of fruit and now you see a face, the key thing here is that you made that face, that it's your explanation that provides a good account of this particular pattern of sensory, uh, sensory input. And this notion, this sort of constructive, active aspect of perception um, has been around since the students of Plato through Kant, but I, I think most um, elegantly paraphrased by Helmholtz. Um, for example, objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous mechanism. Again, implying it has to be on the inside before it can be perceived. And this is very closely related to the notions um, of people like Richard Gregory, who explicitly framed perception as hypothesis testing. Again, this notion of the sensory input is just there to check whether you've got a good explanation for your world. 
These ideas have been used to great effect uh, in machine learning, uh, for example, by people like Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Diane, who have um, used Bayesian probability theory in conjunction with um, Richard Feynman's um, uh, formulation of inference in terms of free energy to create a Helmholtz machine, which can be thought of as a machine learning homologue of the Bayesian brain. So um, basically looking at the brain, again, as a fantastic organ, but an, an organ that's performing inference, inferring abductively what's out there, what could have caused this. So how might it work? Well, let's just go back to Helmholtz's notion of producing impressions on the nervous system. And what this conjures to mind is that there's a world out there and it's generating sensory impressions. They fall upon our epithelia, our, our retina, our eyes, our ears as impressions or shadows. And our job is to try and create a hypothesis or explanation or expectation as to what caused this particular shadow on our sensory veil. And um, current thinking um, um, suggests that the mechanisms, the, the, the connectivity in the brain, the architectures in the brain that do this comply with this um, notion of predictive coding also known as Bayesian filtering um, in engineering. And it's very, very simple. Uh, so let me just take you through it because um, uh, once you understand it, it, you know, it, it sort of demystifies um, a lot of our understanding of how the brain talks to itself in terms of neuronal message passing. Um, so I've just written down mathematically uh, what this scheme does. Um, mu here is an expectation, a mean, an expectation about what what could have caused this sensory shadow or sensory impression. It's, the dot means it's updated, and it's updated um, with two terms. Basically, if I knew the state of affairs out there, uh, then I could predict what the, what the sensations or the state of affairs will be in the, next, um, in the next moment. But I could also use prediction errors to update that prediction um, to make it a better explanation for what's going on. So what are prediction errors? Well, imagine we have this sensory impression, this shadow here, um, and we had some expectation mu that it was being generated by a howling dog. And if I had a generative model that took my expectation, was able to generate what I would have seen if this expectation had been correct, then I can generate this prediction, compare it to the actual sensation, and form a prediction error. And what this equation says is that this prediction error is used to destroy itself in the sense that I can now improve and drive changes in neural activity encoding what I think's out there until the prediction error is eliminated. So that elimination is simply encoded here mathematically as the squared prediction error. So it's a kind of um, minimizing the residual uh, error device that we use every day when doing t-tests, for example. Crucially, um, we're going to weight it by its precision. So if we think that these errors are, are convey precise information, then we're going to be um, more exuberant in the way in which we use them to uh, drive or update our expectations. Now notice here that this scheme, all it's saying is that we're reducing prediction errors. And if we can reduce prediction errors to a minimum, then we have a good enough account of our sensorium. It's not saying we'll ever actually know what's out there. In this instance, this, this shadow was actually caused by a cat, but that doesn't matter. If you can get through life with a good enough explanation, minimizing your prediction errors, job done. So that's an appealing and very simple um, explanation for everything that we perceive and do in the following sense. If we can reduce the imperative for making sense of the world and acting upon that world um, to a minimization of these precision weighted prediction errors, then there are two ways we can do that. We can either change our mind, we can um, change the neural activity encoding those expectations to make the ensuing predictions more like the sensations and that will reduce the prediction error. But also there's another way of minimizing prediction error we can actually change the sensations by actively resampling the world by literally palpating our fingers or moving our eyes to visually select some new sensations that will conform to our predictions. So 
This provides a picture of action, which is in the service of selectively sampling those things that we predict, which means that action now effectively uh, fulfills the prophecies of our, of our perception. And we'll see an example of that um, um, in the closing stages of this presentation. So um, this is a particular example of the message passing, which I'm gonna use to simulate false inference um, before uh, getting to the denouement of this presentation. Um, I would normally use a human brain just to uh, um, unpack the message passing and, and the mechanics that we've been talking about, but I'm gonna use a, a bird brain, a songbird brain, uh, for reasons which will become clear in the next slide. So this is a sort of layout and the connectivity that we have in mind when talking about this predictive coding scheme. Um, where there are some actions that come in, sorry, some actions, say, of another bird generating some sensory fluctuations, sensory impressions here that come into the auditory thalamus. And these are compared with top-down predictions to form a prediction error, uh, which then is sent up to drive updates to that expectation so that the prediction error is eliminated. But notice these expectations are themselves in a hierarchical setting also in receipt of top-down predictions. So we can form a secondary prediction error here in the higher vocal center, uh, which can be used to inform and refine and nuance our higher order expectations, leading to a notion of hierarchical inference and sort of um, an explanation for the sensorium that has increasing hierarchical depth or levels of abstraction. Um, and, um, at every level of the hierarchy, we're trying to minimize the prediction error to provide a good prediction, a good account of our sensations. And this is just what this sort of hierarchical form of this message passing is talking about. Let's just think about action here. But if we have good predictions of what it would be like to generate a song, say a bird song with time and frequency here, we also have predictions of what it would feel like if we were actually singing that song. Um, so we can actually use the same machinery to either make sense of something that we hear, or we can use it to actually generate the sequence that we um, associate with a particular song. And what that leads to is a picture where I can basically switch the brain from a sort of perception mode to a generation or action mode, simply by predicting what I would feel my voice box would, um, the sensations my voice box would supply if I was actually generating these, um, this particular song here. And that switching rests upon this precision that we've been talking about. So if I was perceiving, I'm going to amplify, increase the gain, assign more precision to these prediction errors, uh, um, and then uh, make sense of this particular song and predict all the narrative in, implicit in this sort of deep temporal structure. But if I wanted to sing, I would just ignore the consequences of my action and pay much more attention by increasing the gain or assigning much more precision to these what's called proprioceptive or movement uh, prediction errors so that my reflexes can automatically fulfill the top-down predictions, thereby um, generating the song and actually acting. So this is, if you like, putting classical motor reflexes on top of predictive coding. And that provides a particular perspective on these descending predictions from my expectations. If they're enabled by precision here, they become motor commands that are fulfilled by action. If they are predictions of my sensations in the ex-receptive domain here, the auditory domain, then they become corollary discharge, namely predictions of what I should be hearing uh, that I can confirm by actually listening actively by assigning attention to or precision to the extra-receptive um, uh, prediction errors. Um, from the point of view of the precision control, what that means is that this the descending predictions, not of the content, but now of the precision of the prediction errors conveying the newsworthy content that has not yet been predicted, uh, now become on the motor side, the way of realizing motor intentions, or on the sensory side, the perceptual side, a way of deploying attention, selectively attending to this or that. So Andy Clark, a friend of mine, 
um, puts this very nicely, that the predictioner is of the newsworthy bit of the sensory information because they're the bits you can't predict. But simply having access to newsworthy information is not the complete story. Uh, the real problem is choosing which channels and which sources of news to attend to, to disambiguate between false news, unreliable, low precision news and very precise news. So these predictions of precision become exquisitely important when selecting the kind of news that we will use to update our beliefs and make sense of the world and indeed act upon that world to make sense of it. Um, just to show you how important precision can be and how physiologically real it is in the brain. I want to um, play a little game with you if I can. Um, normally I'd be, um, um, be able to interact with you in person, but I'm gonna to have to ask um, Tanya and Ellie to stand in for all the men and all the women in the audience. Um, so this is a little game <clears throat> that's meant to illustrate um, a certain kind of precision control. And the game is what I'm going to do um, after I count to three, Sherlock Holmes is going to jump from this side of the screen to that side of the screen. And Sherlock Holmes, or the picture of Sherlock Holmes, may or may not change. And your job, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> your job is to tell me whether there was or was not any change in the picture of Sherlock Holmes. Now, what I'd like all the women in the audience to do is to fixate on this central cross and not move their eyes. Conversely, and like all the men in the audience, to track the picture of Sherlock Holmes and try and track it as he jumps from the left to the right. And again, but both of men and the women, that your job is to try and tell me whether anything changed, either the color or the form of the picture of Sherlock Holmes. So if you're ready, I'm going to count down and on three, two, one, he will jump. Right, Ellie, can you tell me what you saw? You'll have to unmute. Um, I saw him jump and there was something flashing, but I, that was all I saw. Did Sherlock Holmes change in any way to, from your point of view? No. Okay, thank you very much. Tanya, what, what did you see? <laughs> Well, I saw something similar. Yeah, I saw something flash in the middle. Some words. I think there were some words there. Um, and to me, he doesn't look changed. You're you're both correct. Um, <laughs> but Tanya is clearly more correct uh, um, <laughs> for a reason which we will which we will understand in a second. So ex you're yeah. exactly right. That's, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Because yeah, you saw the words, whereas yeah. I can almost guarantee Ellie could not see the words or indeed read the words. And the reason is as follows. The only difference, but you, you both saw the same visual information, but the way that you were sampling it was fundamentally different. Um, Ellie was moving actively his eyes um, and thereby subject to a phenomenon called saccadic uh, suppression. He was basically decreasing the precision of the sensory, the visual information that he was generating, in particular the optic flow due to the eye movement itself. So this, if you like, is a very simple but very powerful example of switching the precision off when you're actively doing something. Conversely, Tanya was able to um, not um, to avoid that saccadic suppression and because she wasn't moving her eyes was able to um, access that newsworthy information because it was not attenuated because she wasn't acting. So what this means is that the brain can um, switch the precision or can modulate the synaptic gain of these prediction error neurons on a 50 millisecond time scale. And we have no conscious control over this. This is something the brain has to do. And this is why we don't see the world slipping and sliding every time we move our eyes from the left to the right. We just don't see it. What we actually see is what we um, the, the um, or synthesize is the picture of the world um, after we've actually located the target with our, with, our, with our eye movements. So a very powerful illustration of the importance of sensory attenuation, the attenuation of the sensory precision um, when 
actively foraging for information uh, in this instance in the visual scene. Um, uh, Carl, I, if I, I could just, um, sorry, there, there might be around uh, five minutes or a little bit more. Not sure if um, if you can do that, but just sure. Yeah. I shall I shall race through to the to the denouement, and then we can get to the more, most interesting part, which is usually the discussion. Um, so we, I think we've done all the heavy lifting now. Uh, there is one more slide. I think I think uh, would, would bring a, um, a bit of intuition to to the to, to the. Um, to the game here. Um, in brief, what, what the idea is that here is that, that somehow people with um, psychosis have lost the ability to do this attenuation and augmentation of their precision, um, which means that it's very difficult for them to select the right sensory information. Um, and in, in brief, basically, um, one can see um, or understand um, uh, a lot of the false, um, the, the, the negative symptoms of schizophrenia as an inability to modulate the precision of sensory prediction errors. And many of the compensatory responses, the psychotic states, is an attempt to get on top of that. And had we had time, um, I would demonstrate that. But let me just illustrate it um, for you in terms of you know, um, normal perception. Um, this notion of basically um, balancing the precision or the uh, uh, precision afforded to the sensory evidence relative to your what's called prior beliefs in this hierarchical predictive coding construction um, um, has an enormous influence on the way that we um, make sense of things and interpret things. So um, let, let me just illustrate that for you. Um, say um, I showed you this um, pile of pebbles and you might um, you know, have two hypotheses that you know, this was indeed pebbles or it could be a pile of coins and you might prefer this particular hypothesis here. But I can now give you another interpretation or hypothesis that explains this particular set of uh, stimuli for example, it is a face. And that would give you another hypothesis. But now this is a much more accurate, much more precise hypothesis, which you can't get rid of. So even if I represent now the original stimuli, you still can't, you cannot not see the inverted face here. So I irreversibly now changed the precision and the sensitivity and the efficacy of your connections so that um, you're now assigning much more precision or confidence to these higher level beliefs that encode the expectation of a face. So that's the basic idea. Um, and we can simulate that using, um, in this instance, an, um, um, a simulation of auditory perception um, using uh, um, little synthetic birds. I won't go through this in any detail. The basic story is that if you lose, if you fail um, to assign the right amount of precision to the lower levels of the hierarchy, the sensory levels, um, um, and you fail to attenuate the precision when you say act, then everything becomes surprising because you can't ignore everything is false news and it all gets in. Um, um, and this provides a, a nice metaphor for things like the mismatch negativity. If you um, now try and compensate um, and have very, very precise beliefs about what's causing your sensations, then effectively they become unentrained by the sensory input and you start to, in simulation at least, um, generate these sort of hallucinoses or hallucinations um, where this is what the bird is hearing um, and yet this, is, this should have been the, um, uh, what the, what the um, bird should have been perceiving. Um, so that's basically it from the point of view of an account of psychosis. Just to briefly summarize that, uh, negative signs or um, trait or abnormalities, things like attenuated violation responses, such as uh, mismatch negativity, loss of perceptual gesti, psychomotopoly, uh, resistance to illusions. These can all be construed uh, in terms of false negatives that rest upon a failure of neuromodulation computationally a failure to get that balance of precision right. Um, and we can invoke a sort of, if you like, um, 
secondary explanation for the positive symptoms in terms of false positives, where there's a compensatory increase in the precision of the higher level beliefs, the expectations that best explain our input. Um, beyond psychosis, nearly every clinical condition in psychiatry and a lot of neurological conditions have been, if you like, subject to this kind of explanation through the lens of precision control. I'm just don't read this. I'm just saying, making the point that this is maybe a very generic explanation that goes well beyond psychosis and indeed to normal um, to normal per uh, um, uh, perception. This is the last slide, which really sort of um, is the denouement, which just recapitulates something that Tanya was talking about at the end of her presentation, which is, well, if that's the structure of um, our physics of sentience that rests upon this delicate connectivity in the brain that is controlled by the synaptic efficacy that is carefully orchestrated through neuromodulation that itself depends upon um, neurotransmitters um, that have a neuromodulatory action that change the gain uh, or the excitation inhibition balance, um, then, it's, then it speaks to the possibility of getting in there in the right um, controlled way um, with drugs that act upon the receptors that control the gain or, or the, from a computational perspective, um, the precision. Um, so how can that um, how can that be sort of understood heuristically? So I'm borrowing the slide from Robin's um, sort of rebus um, um, uh, formulation of, of this basic idea. And what would what we're basically saying, if you remember, Tanya was talking about sort of rigid ways of behaving and sort of trying to get out of the rut and relaxing uh, and exploring new options in terms of making sense of the world, uh, or indeed are uh, exchange, exchange, exchanges with it, then this is exactly what this precision control will do or um, um, uh, how it can be affected by drugs that affect neuromodulation. So I just schematize that. So this might be sort of um, a brain that has learned to assign lots of precision to these high level beliefs, um, providing very precise top down predictions that are veridical or possibly not. Um, so let's assume that in fact they cease to become veridical and we have actually got stuck in our ways in a way that is uncomfortable and possibly psychopathological. One way of resolving that is to reduce the precision at higher levels of the hierarchy and pay more attention to the sensory input and essentially flatten the landscape of these semi-squared prediction errors in my world, this we are free energy landscape. And that literally allows you now, because you've relaxed the priors at the higher levels in the hierarchy, you now are afforded the opportunity of exploring a landscape of alternative hypotheses. But that's only happened because you've reduced the precision or the commitment to these very higher level uh, beliefs in this hierarchical construction of the fantasies that best explain our lived exchange with, with the world. Um, there are some interesting electrophysiological correlates of this, which are actually fully endorsed by empirical study of, uh, say, electrophysiological responses and the functional anatomy, which we briefly mentioned um, uh, pr um, uh, in the introduction. So that's the, uh, the denouement. Then you'd have to ask Robin to come and explain how Rebus works in the context of um, psilocybin um, assisted therapy. Um, so I will close now and just uh, it just remains for me to thank um, all the people who I've been uh, whose ideas I've been talking about and of course thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed and I'll stop sharing now. Th thanks so much Carl. We're, we're going to keep going um, for a bit. Um, uh, it just might be, I just might take two minutes to relate in a bit more of a clinical language um, the application of your theories. But I feel like I've got a bird brain when I hear you talk. So please, uh, Carl, correct me uh, at any stage um, with this attempted application of the theory to clinical issues. So, so, so clinically, um, so we, we, we all have internal models of the world. Um, and sensory data comes in into our sensoriums and we have a barrier between us and the world. 
uh, which and, and that barrier uh, consists of sensory um, aspects of ourselves and both and, and motor aspects of ourselves. And that, that barrier keeps us independent from the world, otherwise we'd just melt into the world. So we need to stay independent of the world and we have our internal working models and how our, our brains function, which explains a great deal about uh, psychopathology, how our brains function is it basically takes the incoming information and compares it to our pre-existing models of the world, which we have learnt via our experiences and our genetics. And when there's a mismatch um, in, in the incoming information compared to our pre-existing beliefs and models of the world, that mismatch, the brain will automatically operate to decrease that mismatch. It doesn't like the mismatch. It wants the incoming information to, um, to match its preconceived notions about the world. To, do, to, to, to decrease the mismatch, it can do one of two things. Either it can change its pre-existing working models of the world, in other words, we could learn something new about the world and ourselves, but for some reason, we don't seem to like to do that humans. So the other way to decrease the mismatch or the free energy uh, is to distort the incoming information or to change the incoming information so that it matches our pre-existing notions about the world. Um, and hopefully people can start to see how this model has massive explanatory power for all types of mental illnesses um, because everything that uh, we consider mental illnesses from the neurotic spectrum through to the borderline spectrum to the, the through the psychotic spectrum as Carl's uh, discussed can be understood as distortions in reality and in fact psychoanalysis has always understood psychopathology as based in distortions of reality um, through mechanisms called defense mechanisms which do two things, they distort reality and they remove um, difficult emotional experiences by distorting the reality. And you could understand difficult emotional experiences as those triggered by a significant mismatch because I have a way that I need to see the world and that keeps me safe. Something else comes in and there's a significant mismatch and that's gonna trigger an emotion in me. And so the mechanism in my brain which decreases free energy in a clinical sense, you could say, well, it's going to decrease, it's going to distort my reality in a way that's going to get rid of the uncomfortable feeling. And that's, um, I guess, a subjective or clinical way of understanding this process of decreasing free energy, um, which is wonderful because it means that we can move from this abstract theoretical mathematical ideas um, and uh, which, which could map onto neuroanatomy uh, to a clinical theory of the mind which is transdiagnostic so it understands mental illness through the underlying um, distorted beliefs or um, priors that we have about the world that we have learned um, it's also i would suggest a very uh, humanistic way uh, of understanding uh, psychopathology because it's not you and it's not me that I'm sane and you're not sane. It's that we're all on a spectrum and we all distort the world to a, to a, you know, to a degree. Um, and it also, um, the way I understand it, means that symptoms of mental illness are meaningful because they arose, these distortions that we have of the world arose in um, certain situations, often in our early lives. And at that time, when, they, when the distortions arose, they were not distortions. Um, they, were, um, they were how I needed to interpret the world to survive. And they, they just got stuck um, since that time. And even though now they misinterpret the world because the world has changed, they can be understood uh, in terms of, of where they arose. Um, and what my understanding of how psychedelics fits into that is that psychedelics, rather than me constantly distorting um, or altering through action, through um, active inference, um, as Carl was discussing, through rather than my mind altering the information that's coming in to me through my actions, 
Um, psychedelics seem to allow us to alter our pre-existing models of the world. So we can see things new, including how I relate to how I relate to myself and to others. Um, and that's my attempt to translate uh, the neuroscience into a clinical language. Carl, I'm not sure what your thoughts on that are. I, I was very impressed. That was very, that was very eloquent. I, 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 a really nice point you brought out, which, which um, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, I should have, I should have highlighted. Um, um, is is that you know this is a a calculus of beliefs, you know, a person's beliefs about themselves, about their world, that has. Um, that can be written down in a way that a physiologist, a pharmacologist, and an anatomist would understand. But having having beliefs at, at the core of, if you like, the computation, um, you know, is, is as you say, broadens the expansionary scope and, and, and licenses, um, you know, an understanding of of people's you know distress and emotions and and beliefs, you know, in terms of the underlying physiology and anatomy. Which is, I think, important from a therapeutic point of view. If you want to have both the, you know, the drug and and the context, um, and, you know, and the belief systems um, as as part of a therapeutic target. So I have a question. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yes, yeah, my mic off. Is my mic on? Yeah, Carl. Um, I just have a question for you, and that is: so, with um, with these medicines. How do you, um, with the psychedelic assisted therapies and so on, how do you, why do you think that they're having such success? Like as a neuroscientist, what is it, what is it about these treatments that makes them so much more effective than current existing treatments? I understand what Ali was saying too, in taking into consideration what he said. Um, I think it's because they, um, they they realize the potential um, of a um, a brain that is already in place but has just got locked into a particularly aberrant or or pathological way of uh, of sense making. So instead of trying to sort of re-engineer the brain or do psychosurgery or indeed neurosurgery or um, um, to change the, um, in Elliot's words, the internal model that is brought to the table to explain interpersonal reactions or any exchange with the world. Um, but these particular drugs are really just about retuning and enabling latent hypotheses to be explored. So, you know, if you can equip a patient with the ability to look at something from a different perspective and to assign a degree of credence or precision to other ways of looking at things and, and hypothesizing and challenging their pre-existing hypotheses, technically their prior beliefs about what would happen if I did that, but enable them to explore alternatives, then that seems to me you know, a good description of much of the therapeutic ambition, you know, to create a safe space in which it is, uh, in which the, the client or the patient can test out hypotheses and implicitly explore alternative hypotheses. So that dissolution of these um, um, very precise um, 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 hypotheses where you're trapped in these free energy minima, and, you know, um, this dissolution through the use of things like psychedelics seems to me the perfect mechanism to explain how you can be, you can start to explore other um, other other um, other hypotheses. It, it also, you know, you should one should be able to guess that this would be the way forward if you just look at all other useful approaches to um, enabling people to become more skilled in terms of deploying attention and you know relaxing commitments to to particular um, not delusions but sort of you know uh, pathological beliefs, say in obsession compulsive disorder or certain belief systems you have in uh, agoraphobia or depression or indeed anxiety, you know, um, that rely upon internal attention states or mindfulness. All of these things are really getting some overt control over the way you deploy your attention or attenuate your attention, um, mathematically deploying the precision hierarchically, which just is the target of things that act upon 5-HT2A receptors. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. I, there's a number of questions here now, and I think the questions are going to start pouring in. So, um, we'll I'll, I'll ask quick questions, quick quick as you can answers, and we'll see how many we can get through. Does that sound good? <laughs> um, so here's one from Giannis. Is there a way of integrating salience dysregulate dysregulation hypotheses of schizophrenia? Hang on. Sorry, Ali, can you just read that? My my screen just went a bit funny. Yes. Um, is there a way of integrating salience dysregulation hypothesis of schizophrenia, a midbrain hypothesis, to the error correction free energy hypothesis, which is a cortical substrate? Also, can you make a statement of five HT2A receptor function psychedelic targets and free energy functions? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and I'm mindful you want short answers, but I, I, can't, I can't give you a short answer to that one. It's a great question because, of course, the, the target 5-HT2A receptors are probably much richer in the cortex, and in particular sort of uh, the deeper layers, layer 5 of the cortex, for example, in the parietal um, uh, regions, which means that the site of action is not in the mid-brain dopaminergic uh, regions. So we're talking about the kinds of prediction errors that we use for perceptual synthesis, for state estimation, not for action selection and value learning. Uh, the maths is very, very similar, but the, if you like, the aberrant precision or the aberrant salience um, um, arises in the domain of, uh, of, of, of more of state estimation and perception as opposed to um, uh, the, 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 the midbrain uh, dopaminergic uh, value system. So it's a great question, but I would say psilocybin is not the drug you would want if you wanted to understand broken precision or salience in terms of reward prediction errors. You'd be looking much more at the drugs of addiction um, and those that act directly or indirectly upon the dopaminergic system. That's not psilocybin. Psilocybin is a different kind, a more general kind, of, as you rightly point out, probably a more cortical uh, prediction error minimization of a much more general or ubiquitous sort. Thanks so much for that one. And then there's this one from Michelle. Um, and so Ellie, I might also ask you to, to reflect on the answer for this one as a psychiatrist. Um, from Michelle, while I'm very excited about this area of research and the potential clinical application, I do think it is a little preliminary to say that psychedelic assisted therapy is more effective than other treatments, therapies. Don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater just yet. So firstly, I might just comment there, Michelle, and just say, um, we, we didn't mention it today, but if you have a look at the, the trial that's just been completed at Imperial College, which was a direct comparison between psilocybin and um, isotelopram, an antidepressant. What was found was that after just two treatments of the psilocybin with psychotherapy um, versus isotelopram, isotelopram group who were taking daily doses of isotelopram with psychotherapy as well, At the end of the trial, twice as many people who were in the psilocybin group went into remission they also had a far lower um, incidence of side effects and also suicidal ideation. But Ellie, you might also want to comment on that. And also, of course, Professor Bruston might also want to comment on that question. I mean, in some ways I agree, you know, and I, it's, we do need more research, but I think there's enough research to say that, you know, this is going to be, um, it's, it, it's a powerful treatment. I mean, the effect size is a, a large, um, but yes, we do need more research. But I, I also just want to um, say one more thing briefly, that the mechanism of treatment is really quite different. And uh, there, are, there are other articles sort of comparing the mode of action of 5-H2-2A receptors to 5-HT-1A receptors in the sense of comparing them to um, classic SSRI treatments and the classic treatments we have. And to put it in, I guess, a non-technical term, these medications seem to um, support integration of uh, emotional difficulties and traumas and other issues that have been cut off from you know, the, the conscious awareness. Whereas I think a lot of the treatments we have these days are more symptom controlling. And so I also think that that's an important aspect uh, to mention about the treatment. Thank you for that. And did you want to add anything to that, Paul? 
Oh, no, no, I'm learning. That was very interesting. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so there's a question here saying, so breaking down ego is the same as dismantling the hierarchical pathway. I think it's a question. Is that a question? <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I think, yeah, I, th I, that's, I think that is, a, I mean, it depends what we mean by ego, obviously. Um, but that, that sort of controlling, sometimes narcissistic um, part of our minds, very cognitive and, and controlled, if, if we're talking about that as ego, then yes. Yeah, I, I concur. I mean, you know, there's some lovely connections between some sort of ego dissolution and loss of. So Ellie was talking about he wanted to say Markov blankets, but didn't 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 actually say them earlier on. But, mm -hmm. but you know, um, that notion of ego dissolution and the dissolution of of certain blankets, even within the hierarchy, is is intimately and can be simulated by abnormal precision control and synthetic um, psychedelic experiences. So, and that flattening of the landscape that we were talking about before mm -hmm. is again, as you know, a, a mathematical picture of um, dissolving any sort of fixed central you know, belief about me and you know, self and, and that's, how. That's that's your rebus. That's the rebus model, yeah. The yeah. relaxed brain under stress. Is that yes. Is that right? <laughs> I, I can't remember. I, I've said it so much. Um, you'll have to ask Robin. I can't remember what the actual acronym uh, sounds for, but that's that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So, so, re, yeah so that notion of relax, say, re relaxing mm. stringent constraints, very precise constraints on mm. very high level hierarchical constructs, mm. hypotheses, that normally pertain to me as an agent and my um, my uh, exchange with the world. That normally also come along with emotions. I mean. You, know, you have to think carefully, what do you mean by an emotion? And in my world, an emotion is just another hypothesis to explain everything. Um, and usually it's a kind of explanation you bring to the table when you're uncertain. You know, where, so uncertainty, um, mathematically expected surprise is unbounded. And then there are nice connections with bounded and unbounded free energy or Freudian sort here. But you know, all quite simply understandable is you know, when, when, when you're uncertain about what to do, when you're hypotheses have become imprecise. Um, that is usually associated with negative emotional valence. Um, and your response to that is to try and impose some sort of you know, precision upon that. But if you elect to commit to the wrong kind of hypotheses, you can get locked into certain pathological um, hypotheses, ways of exchanging with people or the world. And the idea would be that you need to explore other ones, which brings us back to the potential therapeutic efficacy of psilocybin uh, but you know with deference to Ellie's observation that you know there are you know lots of drugs work on sociologic system and you know it may be that the, the final mode of action may be actually you know very very similar but just more precisely controlled with, um, with psilocybin. Well, thank you for that um, there's a question here from Greg what are the dangers of changing a person's sense-making hierarchy uh, same question regarding altering the depth of the minima in the energy landscape. Uh, well, uh, I've, uh, sorry, flippantly, all that comes to mind is a bad trip. Um, I, I, I can't see any long-term dangers. It would be interesting if the person asking the question um, would, would, you know, could come up with a couple of um, what what they thought might be dangerous about about doing that. Okay, and Ellie, do um, you have any? Sorry. No, go on, Ellie. Ellie, any any comment about that one? I was just going to say that so far in in the trials, when it's done in a medically controlled environment and a safe environment. Um, it hasn't happened yet in the trials, um, so people have difficult experiences. But that's like any good therapy, you know, you need to work through the difficulties to sort of come out the other side. Um, and so as long as the person has been supported and felt safe, the experiences can be difficult, but ultimate, ultimately rewarding and healthy. And uh, so far, uh, there haven't been significant side effects in the trials of, of sort of um, readjusting our hierarchies and um, question here from Emily, in relation to the free energy theory, why does physiological arousal anxiety occur when our perception is trying to integrate new information which doesn't conform to our previous beliefs? 
Uh, that's a, a great question. Um, so that lack of conformity is basically um, going to um, introduce or induce an uncertainty over the range of hypotheses that you're bringing to the table to explain what's going to going, going on. So if you can't find a hypothesis or an expectation, remember the dog in, in, the, in the simple example of perceiving the howling dog, um, if you can't find one that explains everything adequately, so things just don't fit, then what will happen is that you, you can imagine you've got, say, five hypotheses, or and one's not winning. So all of them now are in play. And that basically means that you have a state of uncertainty, mathematically it'd be um, reflected in something called entropy, um, which is just basically the average surprise. So I think that's a nice semantic because, you know, you, you know, Ellie was talking about the minimization of free energy, which is synonymous with the minimization of this sort of precision weighted prediction error. Um, when we think about um, the future, then we don't actually have the prediction error at hand. So what we have to do, in fact, what we actually probably do do, is work out the expected prediction error or the expected surprise. So we're always compelled to resolve uncertainty through our actions. And if that fails, that can feel awful. Um, so this is, you know, for some people, um, the, you know, the, 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 the mathematical basis of stress and anxiety. It's the failure to resolve uncertainty, um, expected surprise. So, you know, if you're confronted with a situation you just cannot predict that induces all of these unpleasant, um, this unpleasant feeling um, in the sense that you can't, you don't know whether to choose that hypothesis or that hypothesis. And in particular, when these hypotheses are about the narrative that you will pursue, the policies that you will select. What am I going to do next? Am I going to leave home? Am I going to make that phone call? How am I going to you know, present myself in this particular way? Um, then then you, you can see immediately that um, an a, being unable to, um, to f find a, a good explanation for these outcomes is necessarily going to, going, going to introduce um, both uncertainty in terms of Bayesian belief updating, but also stress and anxiety uh, you know, as the explanation for why you've currently got this particular um, uh, level of uncertainty. Hmm, okay. Um, and there's a question here. Is there an explanation for how it evolved this Bayesian inference machine? For how evolved this Bayesian inference machine function is? Um, there is, um, I'll try and keep this one brief. Um, so th there are many levels of um, inference um, cast as optimization. For example, we can look at making sense of the world as inferring states of affairs in the world. We can look at learning as inferring the parameters or the contingencies of these internal models as encoded by synaptic connection strengths um, so we're talking about associative or experience dependent plasticity in the brain. But there's also learning at a neurodevelopmental timescale. And there's also learning at a, a, an evolutionary timescale. At every point, at every level of these nested um, optimization or inference processes, um, you are optimizing the same quantity, which is this um, um, free energy uh, proxy for what's technically a marginal likelihood. That works all the way up to natural selection. So natural selection can be um, written as Bayesian model selection that's trying to optimize or minimize this measure of expected uncertainty. So to put simply, um, natural selection is in the game of um, optimizing phenotypes that are have the best internal models of their of their econiche. And then we also do that at, at a developmental time scale uh, during um, you know, during our lives. Thank you, that's fantastic. Um, I think what we're going to do now is, um, Ellie, uh, did you have any other questions you wanted to ask Carl? Because otherwise I've got one more question to ask him at the end when I've just gone through the final slides. Did you have anything else? Or no, we'll just go back on to them. Um, Scarlett, could you just pop the slides back on, please? And we'll just mm. do the quick wrap up. Yes, and then certainly. I'll be able to thank Carl formally and ask you one last question. <laughs> okay. In fact, I'm going to give you the question now, Carl, and then I'm going to, in a few minutes, I'd just love you to tell us what, what, how you see the potential of these new treatments, how you believe that they have the potential to 
affect many lives or what, what you think, you know, what would be your, your ultimate wish, I guess, for humanity in terms of those treatments. So we're now up to, um, yes, so our webinars are free, but we really, we're a charity and my husband and I, whilst we're philanthropists, um, we can't do this alone. So we really encourage you all to make a donation, support our mission of making these treatments available. And um, you can do this at the time of reserving your ticket, which is too late for that now, but <laughs> also um, you can do it, um, anytime now online. Thanks so much. Next slide. Um, we also have a psychological support service which provides counselling and other group work and other support training and, and mentoring for those who are working with the medicine. So while the medicines are not legal, uh, it is legal for us to have a, a support service like this that provides integration and other support. And we have um, therapists all around Australia who can support your work. Next slide, thank you. Tim Ferriss recently said, and he's one of really one of the great investors and donors in this space as well. And he said that there's a really strong opportunity now for each of us to contribute to this field. And that in the long, to, well, not in the short to medium term, there's the potential to affect millions of lives. There's not many opportunities like this really to, to really create a paradigm shift. And this is why my husband and I are so passionate about this field because this is an opportunity to really create systemic change in the treatment of mental illness for many people, or for all people. We're not suggesting these are the only treatments by any means. Next slide, thank you. So how can you help? Of course, share this webinar and share all our webinars, join our chapters, volunteer. We have a wonderful learn section on our website. Talk to your doctors, medical professionals, uh, certainly, um, if you're a therapist, join the Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies course. Please fundraise or donate for us and talk to your, your MPs, talk to every doctor, every MP you can um, to make sure that people are educated about the science and the data and not focused on the prejudice and stigma. And do attend our events, our summit and so on. Next slide, thank you. Uh, so this is the Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies. As you can see, there's a wide range of um, practitioners who are eligible for it, depending on, you know, particular qualifications um, that you have in an interview process. But we have a few places remaining for intake too, um, and they will probably be snapped up in the next few days. So we really encourage you to register as soon as possible. Next slide, thank you. This is some of the, the wonderful scientists and researchers and doctors and others who are joining our summit in November. And Carl, we'd be very interested to see how you might want to be involved in that as well. So I'll talk to you offline about that as well. Um, we'd like to offer all of you who are on this call a special code for a discount if you want to attend the conference and that's MMA 2021. And until June the 30th, we have, um, a special um, early bird as well. So there's some wonderful opportunities at the moment to get tickets cheap. We've already sold over 500 tickets to the summit and it will definitely go ahead. Um, some speakers may be um, streaming in, but the majority of speakers we're hoping to, to get into Melbourne. Next slide, thank you. And we have a number of wonderful upcoming events. This one on mental illness and the serotonin pharmacy, looking at the interface of antidepressants with psychedelics and, you know, the, the with, I suppose the tapering off of antidepressants that's necessary for certain treatments uh, with psychedelics, that'll be very interesting. Then we have Dr. Michael Winkleman, a, a wonderful anthropologist um, on the 14th of July. We also have um, five years on, What what is the future of psychedelics? How is this whole industry going to look in five years time, 28th of July. We have um, seminars coming up about ketamine um, and Dr. David Nutt, of course, in October. And there's more going to be announced shortly, including Francoise Bouzart and others. Next slide, thank you. Or is that it? I think that's it. <laughs> okay, that's go, we'll go. okay, great. We'll close that now, thank you. And um, 
so I just want to say, by the way, to all of you that are that are on um, the presentation, uh, please do give us your feedback and any good quotes that we can quote in um, in our website and so on. Um, I just personally like to say thank you to Carl for his incredible wisdom and the work that you've done um, is legendary. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're all fans over here uh, for you and your work. And I know that there's people from all different countries on this on this call and people who will be watching your video and we're very grateful to you. And I guess just leave you, I'd just love to hear you, you know, answer that question on what you think the future might hold. Just a, I always ask this of every presenter that we have. Um, I'm I, I, in part smiling at Dave Nutt's um, title, um, How Neuroscience Puts Psychedelics Back into Psychiatry, because I was going to say the, the exact opposite. So I, a very pragmatic um, and strategic, more than sort of clinically and, uh, and compassion motivated response is if you can establish an evidence base for the clinical utility of psilocybin-assisted um, therapy, that would make it much easier for people like Robin, me, and Dave now um, to um, uh, remove the impediments for basic neuroscience research so that, so that you could realize a, a circular causality and added value between the basic neuroscience of the, you know, and the neuroimaging and the neuro neuropharmacology of uh, a belief updating brain and the, uh, the, the, the clinical leveraging of those insights uh, so that there's a two way talk. So that would be you know, um, fantastic. Um, the, I think exactly the same theme can be, um, one would hopefully realize not between basic neuroscience and, um, and, and psychiatry or psychotherapy, but between um, biological psychiatry and, um, uh, and psychotherapy and other forms of mental health care. I think that, you know, having a more holistic and shared commitment to, a, um, to the use of pharmacology to set the right context for psychotherapeutic interventions that were, you know, as deeply informed. Um, I think that will be a wonderful thing and a much more holistic and appropriate way of, 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 of leveraging the different silos of expertise in the mental health care industry. Hold on. Ellie, did you want to um, add anything else or ask Carl any last questions while you have the opportunity? <laughs> Uh, it's okay. I just wanted to thanks. Thank you so much, Carl, for your time. Well, it's been an honour to talk to you, and a great, a great, great pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and and Carl, I'll, I'll send you a note shortly, um, and um, we'll stay in touch about some other opportunities that might come up. And we hope to meet you in person one day when the world, I don't know, reemerges in some form or other, mm -hmm. <laughs> or at least as a hologram or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's an honor and thank you again from all of us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>